One of the first lessons of meditation is seeing how disorderly and chaotic your mind can be. A stream of consciousness novels have nothing on strange shifts. And incongruous fragments that the mind can toss up. If you try to trace where your mind has been and try to trace the conversation, even over the course of maybe five minutes, it zigs and zags all over the place. And when we're getting the mind to settle down, we, of course, are trying to stop that, get things focused, get things centered. But in the beginning, we actually have to use that ability to think around things from various angles to help get the mind in on the breath, with the breath, in a comfortable way. If the mind has a tendency to think, we'll try to have it think about the breath, think about how comfortable it is, where you feel it, where it feels good, where it doesn't feel good. Give it some work to do. As long as it wants to work, wants to think, we'll give it something good to think about that's related to the breath. And that way it can gradually zero in, zero in on the breath. That's one of the uses of this ability to shift contexts that we have. To be in one story and all of a sudden go through a modulation and find yourself in a totally other, different story a different world. It's also useful for insight. If we didn't have this ability, if everything in the mind were perfectly consistent, we would be mad. You think about people who try to develop a system that explains all of reality, and you realize the person's crazy, where everything is consistent and everything fits very neatly in its own proper place. Our minds are more like a bag full of bits and pieces. Some of the bits and pieces are large fragments and others are just tiny little ones. As we move from one state of becoming to another, what makes sense in one state of becoming is not going to make sense in another. And we learn how to use that. For instance, with the contemplation of the body. We tend to think about our body in certain contexts and the certain things we think about and other things that we banish from our thoughts. And so to help develop a sense of dispassion for the body, you put your body in different contexts. Like a John Sing Tong's image of, would you want to swim in a vat full of saliva? I said, no. And yet you're swallowing it every day. What you're willing to swallow, what you're willing to swim in, those are two different things. Or would you be willing to take a bath in a bathtub of blood? No. And yet you've got it in your veins all the time. In other words, step back and put the different parts of the body in a different context. Then you begin to see how alien they can be. And the same with other things going on in the mind. Step out of your normal context. When you've got a story going on about someone doing this to you or doing that to you, try to get out of the story and look at it from another perspective entirely. I was reading an interview with John McPhee recently. He'd, he'd written that enormous tome on geology, and part of it had a long section on geological time. And he got letters from many cancer patients saying how that really put their minds at peace. When you think about, say, dying at the age 30 when your friends are going to live to be 70 or 80, you think in the normal human time frame that seems to be a real tragedy. But if you think of geological time, but they measure things in millions of years, in fact the smallest unit is a million years, the fact that it's 30 years rather than 70 doesn't seem so bad. It's just a shift of context. So when you find yourself angry at someone or you find yourself attracted to someone, try to shift the context. 
look at it from, from a different way, bring a different set of perceptions. If you perceive someone's words coming right at you, hold the perception. They're going past you. The reason they seem to come into you is that you've, you've got a little vacuum cleaner that sucks up all the dirt, brings it inside. Turn off the vacuum cleaner. Then you realize you're not the victim of that person's words. It's just sounds that go past. You're actually the victim of your own tendency to bring those words in and then use them to stab yourself again and again, right there at the moment when it's happening and then again later. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha uses so many analogies, so many vivid analogies. The one of the bandits sawing off your limbs. He says, if you hold that image in mind, then realize that even in a situation like that, you've got to have goodwill. Then you look at the words that people use at you, and that's, well, at least, at least they're not sawing off your limbs. Or the image of the horse that needs to have the whip down to its bone before it's willing to, to obey. Okay, are, you, are you that kind of meditator? Learn how to think about things in terms of these analogies instead of your normal ones, and it gives you a new perspective and that ability to step out of your thought worlds is what saves you from getting pulled into all the defilements that created those thought worlds to begin with, that picked and chose and decided that this detail you're going to focus on and that other detail you're going to ignore. You have to remember that all of our defilements are based on a partial way of looking at things. They have big blind spots, and so what you've got to do is turn your light on the blind spots. And just remind yourself there must be another way to look at this. One of John Lee's best ways of making sure that you didn't fall for your insights. And when an insight happens, it seems to crystallize lots of different things. All this, everything seems to come together and make perfect sense. And it's really compelling. It's very alluring. He says, well, when that insight happens, ask yourself, to what extent is it false? Look for the fragmentary nature of the insight. It helps to pull you out of a lot of things that could otherwise really make you crazy. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha never set out a system. I mean, there's a consistency to his teachings, but it's a strategic consistency. All the teachings are aimed at the same thing, but they approach it from different angles. Because when you find yourself at one spot, okay, this teaching is going to pull you in the right direction. You're in another spot, another teacher will pull you in the right direction. It's like a John Chai's old comment that when he sees people going off the right side of the road, he says, go left, go left. When they go off the left side of the road, go right, go right. The words may sound contradictory, but the purpose is consistent. And the same with, with all the Buddha's teachings. They, they're aimed at the same thing, but they come from different angles. And the fact that there are so many different fragments and so many different analogies ways of looking at things, and that the Buddha doesn't always use his analogies in the same way. Sometimes, for instance, a stream is a symbol for the stream to awakening. Other times it's the stream of craving. The fact that these two images look the same but are meant differently is supposed to jolt you out of getting complacent. Learn to look at things from different angles in different ways, and you'll learn a lot. Another one of John Lee's comments is that real insight comes. You have to look at things one way, and then you turn them around look at the other way. You take what's taught, and then you take the opposite of what's taught. Toss them around. And someplace in the cracks between those different thought worlds, 
That's where the light of freedom shines. So it's always useful to learn how to question your perceptions. Your perceptions about your body, your perceptions about your relationships with other people. And remember that sanity lies in stepping back. One of the things I noticed about the Ajans in Thailand that I especially appreciated was their sense of humor. And the type of humor that comes from being able to step back and look at things as they really are from an angle that people don't ordinarily look at or look from. There's that old statement, that an old Greek comment about the gods laugh. And why do the gods laugh at human failings? Because the gods are separate. They step back. They're not totally involved. And the Ajans laugh, too. because they've learned how to step back from their own crazy thoughts, their own defilements. So learn how to step out, step back. Look at things from a different angle when things are not going well. Ask yourself, well, what's, what am I believing here? What are the underlying perceptions? Can I look at things using a different set of perceptions? Think of each thought world as a fragment. It's kind of like a hologram. There's always one spot in the hologram where the image cannot be reproduced. Look for that spot so you can step out. That's a lot of what the process of discernment is all about, seeing incongruities and using them for the sake of freedom.